Welcome to the Mount Isa Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, it's great to have you here. Um, if uh, you're just passing through, please don't run away at the end of the service. Stay for a cup of tea and a coffee and, a, and chat to um, get to know you a little bit better. Um, just some announcements. Just a reminder that um, Pastor Tim and his family are away until the 20th of November. Um, so please uphold them in prayer, but also if you're chasing any pastoral needs, um, please contact Ben Beard or myself. Um, after church today, Christy will be giving uh, some time to go through the budget for next year. Uh, so please feel free to stay after church if you have any feedback or questions regarding the budget. Um, yeah, Christy puts a lot of time in this, so please, yep, if you've got any questions or thoughts, um, please come and uh, see that presentation and have those questions answered. Um, Christmas lunch this year if you're going to be in town this year please feel free um, and welcome to join the lunch from 11 a.m. at the top hall um, please RSVP and select a dish that you wish to share with everyone using the link sent out in the church life email or uh, via the link on the fellowship page our monthly prayer meeting will be next Sunday since Tim will only be arriving home that afternoon um, Ben will be hosting the evening's prayer. So that's for you at 7 o'clock on the Sunday night. Um, uh, so while Tim was away, there's no men's marriage course. Uh, this will resume on the 22nd of November. Um, just a reminder too, Bible distribution, that there are Bibles out in the foyer if you wish to distribute these to our community. Um, there's a form to enter your distribution locations in order to avoid doubling up um, next Sunday, the end of um, end of year children's service will be on the 27th. Um, so after their presentation, they will um, head up to the top hall for their breakup party. Um, parents are asked to please provide a plate of food to share for that. 
Um, also, next Sunday will be the AGM. All available members are asked to remain behind after the service. Non-members are also welcome to attend. Um, just not able to vote on any matters, but please feel free to come and just to see, sit in on that and see regarding the um, governance of the church. Um, Mount Isa Baptist Church has been invited to carol at the Mount Isa Shopping Village outside Kmart. Um, so that we've agreed on the 17th of December. Uh, a group chat has been created to communicate further information regarding this, um, or please contact the office if you'd like to be involved with this event. Um, the combined church's Christmas carols are back this year. It'll be held on Sunday the 18th of December at the Civic Centre Lawn. Um, so Mount Isa Baptist has been tasked with organising the music for the evening. Um, this is opened up to all participating churches. A form has been created um, if you'd like to, if you're interested in participating in that evening, whether it be singing, playing an instrument, or even just assisting in being a, a roadie and se setting up the equipment. Uh, so please contact the office if you require any further assistance on that. Um, I'd like to ask the stewards if they could um, take up the offering at this time. If you come, haven't come prepared for that, um, please feel free, just to let the bag pass you by. And, um, Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the many blessings that you give to us and the needs that you supply to us. Lord, as we just bring back a small portion of that here this morning, we just pray for your blessing upon this. In your mighty name, amen. Okay, Sunshine Corner, kids and junior church. If you'd like to uh, make your way quietly out to the back, no need to run, you'll all get there in time. Okay, just um, the rest of the church, a lot of you who have been here for a while, you've, um, you'd be aware of the um, mission in India that we've been supporting for many, many years with the Bible College and all the also the orphanage. We received a um, copy of a letter through from this, um, this week. And I'd just like to read it out um, for what, uh, to inform you what's going on. So this is from uh, Reverend uh, Aaron Samuel. Greetings to you in the name of our triune God. I hope and trust you are doing well. Thank you very much for your prayers and support for the past several years. Evangel evangelism continues to be our heartbeat and, our and we use every opportunity to share the gospel through the personal and mass evangelism. By the grace of God, since 20 2002, we have been conducting open-air crusades on Christmas Day, Easter, and other special meetings in a 3,000 square foot rectangular strip of land behind our mother church. I'm not going to try and pronounce that place. Several, like Gandhi Plana, Gopal ha and Gopal, had trusted Christ during these evangelistic outreaches and are walking with the Lord now. Over the years, the crowd has increased from 1,000 to 1,500 people, thus making it difficult not only to seat them, but also serve, to serve fellowship meal 
as pictures indicate. About seven weeks back, to our surprise, our neighbour called us and offered to sell their land. After much prayer and negotiation, we finally, they finally accepted our offer price of $22,731 with registration for a quarter acre of land. We are pleased to inform you that a couple of generous donors have committed to give a matching gift of $10,000 if we are able to raise the rest. Your help will not only provide additional space for this gathering, but also make it a safe, to make it safe in case of emergency. We also, we also hope that this additional land would open up op opportunities for further ministries. Please do let me know if you would like to contribute. So we'd like to just opening it up to the church, if anyone is wanting to um, participate and donate personally, if you'd like to make um, donations through the offering, if you just put your money in an um, envelope and mark it as um, the India Project, or if you're giving online, um, to also just use India Project as a reference. Um, and as a church leadership, we'll also be looking at um, supporting um, this uh, request. But do we just wanted to open it up to the church family, as I said, we've been involved with this ministry in India for quite a long time. Actually, when we first came here in 2006, um, it was already um, happening back as far as then. And we've had several teams from our church go over there. Ross and Audrey went one year, Ben and a couple of others, and recently Caleb um, and Nathan and Annie have gone to work at this place. So we do have a very strong connection um, with the facility and the ministry over there. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention. If you'd like any more information, um, either come and see myself or contact Sarah in the office. Okay, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles and find James chapter 5. I'll be reading from James chapter 5, 13 to 20. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of, the fa of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And uh, shortly Ben will come up and give his message on that um, passage. So I could just ask the um, team to come back up then. stand and sing it is well with my soul
Good morning, everyone. Oh, everyone's awake today. How awesome is that? I'm pumped. I was very happy with that. Good morning. Let me just get this microphone behaving. All right. Can you hear me all right? No, it's going to fix it up. All right. We have a very interesting passage today. Um, even as I was writing this message, I felt like I was preaching at myself. I have felt very challenged and convicted. Uh, hopefully, as I share God's word with you today, God moves on your heart. He convicts you and sanctifies you. The book of James was written by Jesus' brother, who became extremely influential in encouraging and instructing the Jewish church who had been scattered throughout the Gentile world because of severe persecution. James was not a believer until after the resurrection, but what a powerful transformation in his identity. Acts chapter 7, Stephen was stoned to death for preaching the truth, boldly and directly. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, it says, And Saul approved the execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Sumeria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Relating to this kind of persecution can be challenging for us. 
We don't have enemies ravaging our churches to inhibit our worship or people invading our houses because of our faith. We don't have soldiers dragging us into prison because of our confession. However, there is a similar spirit at work and there is a similar goal that the enemy is striving for. The word used for persecution is diogmos. Diogmos means to drive away, put to flight, to run away, to harass, or to show hostility. It is not about driving people away. If we spoke words that the world enjoyed, I could guarantee you that they would not show us hostility. We are shown hostility when they are exposed to a message that they do not want to receive, the gospel message. Therefore, persecution comes with the goal of driving the truth out or terrifying you into silence. Today, it comes in a different form. Speak truth in public. Be ready to be publicly shamed on social media. Speak truth at work. Be ready to have your job pressured as you are told that you are discriminating against someone else's belief systems. Make the truth public. We've got a problem. Keep it quiet. No problems. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verses 18. I don't know about you, but I feel convicted when I reflect on this topic. If you think about it, open and transparent faith equals resistance. Therefore, if no one is persecuting me, if no one is telling me to stop sharing my faith, if I am not enduring a hardship because I've shared my faith, does that mean that they have succeeded? Am I suppressing the truth? Am I hiding my light under a basket? John chapter 16, verses 18 to 20 says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will also keep yours. This requires vulnerability, doesn't it? As our default position, we search for environments where we feel safe from our suffering. However, if we are living a Christian life where we are following in the feet of our master, we are told that we will be hated and persecuted. If we are not being hated and persecuted, are we, am I, walking in the footprints of my master? How vulnerable should we make ourselves to this suffering? How much vulnerability is too much vulnerability? All I can think of is Jesus' example. When it came to sharing the truth and saving the lost, what was his limits on vulnerability? He knew that he would be crucified for preaching the truth. Did he suppress the truth, water it down, or make it nicer in an attempt to upset less people and perhaps avoid crucifixion? Did he decrease his public appearances and go into private and hidden ministries in an attempt to hide from authorities and make his crucifixion more difficult? No, he preached the truth unsuppressed. He had both public and private ministries running. And as he watched his traitor leave his dinner table to call the authorities, Jesus walked out into an open garden and prayed with sweat and blood, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Even when they came to arrest him with weapons, he walked into their army unarmed. Where was the limits on his vulnerability? I don't know about about you, but my goal is to walk in my master's footprints. The example has been set. When it comes to doing the Father's will, what is our limits on vulnerability? Do we suppress the truth, water it down or make it nicer? Do we keep our ministry quiet and just wait for opportunities or wait for invitations to share our faith? Or do we administer the truth publicly and unmodified knowing with vulnerability that a metaphorical crucifixion is coming if we follow Jesus' model of ministry. There is only one thing that we can do when we make ourselves this vulnerable to affliction. 
pray. Pray to the Father with sweat and blood. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Is anyone among you afflicted? He should pray. Depending on the Bible verse that you use, the Bible version that you use, this verse this verse will ask, are you suffering or are you in hardship or are you afflicted? When you look at the Greek word kakapatheo, this is most accurately, accurately translated into afflicted. Kakapatheo is only used three times in scripture. The first is in the passage that we are reading today. The last two are in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. For which I suffer to the point of being bound like a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. But as for you, exercise self-control in everything, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. When we look at the use of this word, it is safe to conclude that the context is usually a hardship faced from sharing God's word. There is a second way to interpret this this though. Is someone, sorry, there is a second way to interpret, is anyone among you afflicted, he should pray. About this statement, Chuck Smith says, Now it is interesting a distinction is made between affliction and sickness. And I don't always know that we can discern between is this an affliction or is this a sickness. But it would seem that afflictions are used by God for the purpose of correction. That when afflictions come, then I need to pray. I need to find out from God what he's trying to teach me, what he's trying to tell me. The first interpretation that I have provided you with would suggest that the type of affliction is the world disciplining us for sharing the truth. However, this second interpretation would suggest that this type of affliction is God disciplining us for not living a life of truth. Affliction is the tool of sanctification. Sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit that he does in us to purify us and make us more like Christ. This continuous work is about reshaping who we are, making us a new creation. Sanctification is when the Holy Spirit says, hey, This is in your life. That has grown from your sin. We need to remove that. And it's also the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're missing this in your life. I need to add this in. This is just what Pastor Tim was talking about last week in our Ephesians study. We are God's workmanship. He is the potter, shaping us and molding us into who we are meant to be. This work is called sanctification. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Pastor Tim used the analogy of a wooden table that had two otters carved into the tabletop. At the end he posed this question, What tools does God use to shape us? His first answer was the word, and he quoted John chapter 17 verse 17, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. There is that word again, sanctify. His second answer was the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And he drew that from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 14. And finally, his third answer was trials and discipline. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says, For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. If God is afflicting us as a form of discipline, would we as the children say, you are a cruel father? No, he loves us. He is training us and guiding us. It takes a godly perception to look at your affliction and say, this is a sign that God loves me. If this is the type of affliction that James was talking about, then why would we pray? Well, we would pray for discernment to determine whether this affliction is a natural sickness or whether it's God's discipline for something for us to learn. This interpretation has a nice flow to it because in the next verses, if 
sorry, if you discern that it is natural sickness, in the following verses, it tells us to anoint with oil and pray for healing. But if we discern that it's God's discipline, we are told in the next verses to confess our sins to one another so that our sins may be forgiven. So whatever the reason for the affliction, James continues to provide us with the godly remedy. The second half of this verse says, Are you cheerful? Let him sing praises. Again, we have something unique going on here. Just like the word affliction, only being used three times in Scripture, the same Greek word used for cheerful is only used three times. Apart from the one here in James, it is used in Acts chapter 27, verses 22 and 25. Now I urge you to be cheerful, because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For last night an angel of the God I belong to and serve stood by me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. It is necessary for you to appear to Caesar. And indeed, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. So take cheer, men, because I believe, God, that it will be just the way it was told to me. Notice that they have gone through a trial. They went through a storm and were shipwrecked. The first thing Paul says after this disaster, be cheerful. I don't know about you, but I can see the gospel message here. Jesus prayed in agony before and during his death on the cross. But after his resurrection, he was able to say, I am cheerful, for there has been no loss of life. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. This means we should pray to God before and during our afflictions. Even if those afflictions are so severe that it kills us, we are able to say, I am cheerful, for there has been no loss of life, for we have been promised a resurrection. James 14, uh, verse 14 and 15. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Sickness. It even comes to us as Christians. Our faith in God does not make us immune to pathogens, genetic defects, and injuries. What shall a Christian do when they are sick? Notify an elder of the church and receive prayer. Shall we notify the elders every time we get a slight runny nose? Please don't. And if you do, if you do, call Gary, not me. <laughs> Most people notify us at the point of being at hospital. We are very happy to be notified before you are admitted to hospital, when you are quite worried about what is going on with your health. Or perhaps sickness has just been persistent. These are great times to notify the elders. The elders are the shepherds of the church. The shepherds should know when one of the sheep are ill so that they can provide care. However, this also allows the shepherd to notify the whole flock so that the whole flock can be praying for one another's health. Finally, we arrive at the oil. Why should an an, an elder anoint the sick with it? I could give you a quick and easy answer, because scripture tells us to, do we always need to understand everything we do? That's a bit easy, let's dive into it a bit deeper. Another quick answer that I can give you is that it was relevant to the early church, but it's now not relevant to us today. Well, this would most likely be the response from a cessationist, who would focus on the healings and conclude that these healings were required to establish the authority and authenticity of the early church. Today, the authority and authenticity is established, meaning that signs such as these healing, church healings are no longer required. Another interpretation, another way to look at it. In scripture, oil was used for both medicine and as a symbol of the Spirit of God. The parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37, is an example where oil is used for medicine. When the Samaritan found the beat-up man on the road, One of his treatments was to anoint the man with oil. 
Therefore, some will see this as a sign that we should seek medical assistance. Oil was the level of their medical knowledge at that time, and our medical knowledge has grown and advanced until it is what it is today. However, oil has a spiritual significance. The example for this is found in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13, where Samuel anoints David as the promised king. Jesse brings his son before Samuel, and all his sons before Samuel. And God says in verse 7, Do not look at his appearance or his stature, because I have rejected him. Humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Then David came before Samuel, and God revealed that he was the one to be anointed with oil, to demonstrate that he was the promised king. Pouring oil onto David was a physical act that demonstrated spiritual significance. It demonstrates that he was chosen. It demonstrated that he was not chosen for his outward qualities. It demonstrated that he was chosen for what God could see inside his heart. And it demonstrated that he would be a royalty or a king in the future. This spiritual significance is also what is demonstrated when a Christian is anointed with oil. A Christian is chosen by God. A Christian is not chosen for their outside qualities. A Christian is chosen for what God foresees he will do in the heart. A Christian will not be made a king, but in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, we are called co-heirs with Christ. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, we are called a royal priesthood. Therefore, oil can represent both the physical and spiritual spheres of life. Christians should not separate the physical and the spiritual. Jesus Christ is Lord over both the body and the spirit. Let me ask you, though, when you and your fa- all your family are sick, how often do you have a dual response? How often do you seek medical help from humans and spiritual help from God at the same time? I have often gone to the doctors to seek antibiotics for a nasty skin infection and not even thought about praying to God for a healing. Or, as I mentioned earlier, I did not spend time praying to God to discern whether this skin infection had disciplinary purposes in my life. I have also gone to the opposite. I refused to take medicine or go to a doctor. Instead, I just prayed to God for a healing. I think this verse calls for a balanced response towards sickness. It points us towards seeking physical assistance and spiritual assistance at the same time. Unfortunately, some erroneous teachings have stemmed from this passage, one of these being the extreme unction. Extreme unction is a sacrament that the Catholic Church adopted. This is a sacrament where a final anointing is applied to the aged or very sick in preparation for their death. And I'm not going to dive into it. That is very simplistic in what I'm saying. However, it is easy to point out that James spoke of the anointing, the sick with oil, with the purpose of requesting a healing Therefore, anointing someone with oil to prepare them for death is counter-directional to what the scripture is teaching us. Finally, this scripture has been used to condemn Christians who are sick. My grandmother was one of these people. She was driven out of the Baptist church because she was given one year to live after a diagnosis of terrible asthma. No matter how much she prayed, God would not heal her asthma. Therefore, her lack of healing was a sign that she did not have faith and they concluded that she was not a Christian. After all, it does say, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. However, the prayer of faith does not refer to the faith of the sick person, but to the faith of the people praying. God heals, faith doesn't, and all prayers are subject to God's will. But prayer is a part of God's healing process. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. That word raise means to raise from a seat or bed. This brings to mind the story in Luke chapter 5, where the paralytic was lowered through the roof to Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, Friends, your sins are forgiven. Why did he say this to the paralytic when he was trying to get a physical healing? Well, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk. 
But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your stretcher, and go home. Jesus showed us right here a connection between forgiveness of sins and healing of physical afflictions. Which is why our next verse in James starts with the word, therefore. This word connects what we are saying in this verse to where we are coming up to about confessing our sins to one another. James chapter, um, James chapter 5 verse 16. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has pow great power as it is working. Confess your sins to one another. Christ has made it possible for us to go directly to God for forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13 says, In Jesus we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. However, this does not automatically mean that there is no place for confession between church members. When we talked about afflictions earlier, we spoke about the vulnerability that we must have to share the gospel in the model that Christ demonstrated. That, this was focused on our vulnerability with the world. Now we are looking at the vulnerability that we must have with each other within the church. When Adam and Eve had fallen, one of their first actions was to conceal their vulnerabilities. They covered their physical nakedness with leaves. Adam tried to cover his spiritual nakedness by blaming Eve, and Eve tried to cover her spiritual nakedness by blaming Satan. Our fallen nature encourages us to create an environment where our actions are hidden, concealed, unseen, darkened. When we advocate for a church environment where we only confess to special people, such as just elders or just the people that we trust, have we not hidden the sin from the rest of the body of Christ? Are we not concealing? Have we not made it so that our sins are unseen by the majority? We have, are we not darkening ourselves? Consider Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18, 8 to 14. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Don't participate in the fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what is done by them in secret. Everything exposed by the light is made visible, for what makes everything visible is light. What are we exposing? Our own fruitless works of darkness. Everything visible is light. Therefore, if we are children of light, then we must be visible. John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice how this verse is written. If we walk in the light, two things are mentioned. We have fellowship with one another. And number two, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. So what happens if we flip that around? If we walk in darkness, we do not have fellowship with one another. What is darkness? Hiding, concealing, and being invisible. Here are six examples of how we can confess our sins to one another. The first one, asking an individual church member to forgive us for an individual sin that we have committed to them. The second one, if our sin has been the cause of disunity within the church. Three, if our sin has affected the church's reputation amongst the community. Four, if we have struggled with a sin and need godly support to overcome that sin. Five, if we confess our sin to God but don't feel forgiven, it may help you to confess to another Christian to, re to receive assurance of God's forgiveness. And finally, number six, sharing your testimony on how you became a Christian. The second part of the verse from 1 John says that if we walk in the light, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If Jesus cleanses us and forgives us of our sin, then we receive God's righteousness. 
The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greeks. For it is the righteousness of God is from, revealed from faith to faith, just as, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. What is a righteous person? A righteous person is the person who lives by faith. We don't try to achieve salvation, entry into heaven, or time with Jesus by our own good actions. Instead, by faith, we allow God's righteousness to live in us, which achieves salvation, gives us entry into heaven, and gives us sweet, sweet time with Jesus. Therefore, he who lives by faith in Jesus, he is a righteous person, and your prayers have great power at work. Elijah was a man just like us. He was a sinner like you and me. He deserved condemnation to hell like you and me. His good works could not earn him salvation. Like us, he was a man of faith, and his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Therefore, Elijah was a righteous man, and because he lived by faith and received God's righteousness, he showed us how powerful our prayers can be. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it would not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Just before Elijah prayed for rain, he was involved in an important sacrifice. He found a group of people that worshipped a false god called Baal. He, to he told them to get two bulls, and they are to cry out to their god to consume their bull. And Elijah would cry out to his god to consume his bull. Whoever answered the request was the true god. The group of people tried to get their god to answer their prayers through works. They called their gods for long periods of time, morning to noon. They danced around the altar. They yelled to their god loudly. They cut themselves until there was lots of blood. There was no answer to their works. Elijah then showed them how to relate to the true God with faith. He came to the altar and simply prayed, Answer me, O Lord, that these people may know that you are God and that you have turned their hearts back. And God responded and consumed that sacrifice. Jesus is that true sacrifice. If we want God to answer our prayers, forgive our sins, and give us eternal life, we need to ban abandon all of our works that sends the message that we can earn our way into heaven. God does the work. God provides the sacrifice. He sent Jesus to die for our sins. If we want God to answer our prayers, it is simple. We pray with faith. My brothers and sisters, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Even as Christians, we are always wandering from the truth. We must constantly help each other and lead each other back to the feet of Jesus. And we should confess our wandering to each other. For when we assist each other in our wanderings, we care for each other's souls and we cover each other's multitude of sins. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and how it gives us instruction and it gives us life and it gives us sanctification, Lord. We pray for the persecuted church, Lord, that is going on around the world. We pray that you will be with them, Lord. And that although they are persecuted, they will not suppress the truth and they will not run in fear, Lord, that you give them the courage and the power to continue to preach the gospel. Lord, we pray for our church that you will give us the courage to be even more bold in preaching the gospel, Lord, that the fears that we have in sharing openly, you will melt them away and that you will give us boldness, Lord. We pray for the people that are in our church that are sick. We ask that your healing power will come upon them and heal them, Lord. And if there is anything disciplinary in their lives, Lord, we pray that you will highlight it, Lord, and that you will sanctify them and work on them and shape them into who you want them to be, Lord. 
We ask that you build us up as a church, Lord, that we shine a bright light into this community and into the world, Lord, and that we lead many to your feet. We ask that you help us with confessing our sins, as this takes so much vulnerability. We ask, Lord, that you help us open up to each other and we share the work that you're doing in our lives, that we can share not only the sins but the successes that you have had in freeing us from those sins, Lord. We ask that you do a work in our hearts today, Lord, and that we go out and we love our community and those that are around us. We pray for Pastor Tim, who is on holidays at the moment. We ask that you give him rest and that you be with his family and that you bless them, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Ben. Let's stand and sing our, our, our final song.
for joining us this morning and please stay for a cup of tea and coffee and don't forget the um, budget forum. Yes, it is. Look, we noticed um, we'll probably k- want to kick off that say about 10.30 in the large meeting room. So 10.30, as I said, if you're a member and you want to come along, please feel free to come. If you're not a member, also please feel free to come and, and listen in and um, have any questions answered. Thank you.